Hello there, everybody. I'm Mel Allen, and this is Baseball Card Collector. Almost every weekend across the USA, there's a baseball card show. And no matter how big or how small, people are really flocking to them, whether they're six or 60. And they'll usually find their favorite players at these shows. Dealers arrive as early as six in the morning to set up for the nine o'clock stampede. Lines start forming before showtime. I guess you can say the early collector catches the card. Dealer setups range from tabletop displays to extravagant productions. But either way, the collectors usually get what they want, whether it's an autograph of their favorite ball player or that special card that they've been looking for. Now, one of the early pioneers of card shows was Mike Ehrenstein. I had one of the very first card shows. It really wasn't a show. It was by invitation only. Uh, we had uh, about 15 or 20 collectors in my basement, uh, and it was about 1970. Uh, guys came from as far away, I think, as Maryland, which was a, an astronomical trek. I mean, it was like the other side of the world. Well, I think it's just wonderful. Uh, everybody collects something. Everybody. I don't care who the person is. I'm sure you have a collection of something. Uh, I think it's wonderful that people do are collectors because it, it gives them a, a purpose, a, a diversion from the everyday drudgery of life. Some people collect uniforms. Some people collect statues. Some people collect posters, uh, magazines. And uh, everybody should have something to, to collect. Fulfills a need. People need to have stuff. Fun fact. Hey, man, take a look at the Topps 1959 card number 440, Lou Burdett. Lou, a right-handed pitcher, thought it'd be funny to pose as a southpaw. Well, the photographer took the picture, Topps printed the card, and the rest is history. Hey, Lou. Got any rubber chickens? According to all accounts, baseball cards appeared more than a hundred years ago, with the first cards being produced by Old Judge Tobacco. Now, Old Judge was a cigarette brand distributed by Goodwin Brothers of New York. The cards were used as premiums to boost the sales of their tobacco and to gain an edge on their competitors. What Old Judge Tobacco didn't realize was that they were laying the foundation for the modern-day baseball card. The Old Judge cards used photography. The photographs were thin pieces of paper pasted on cardboard. Now, this not only made the photo rigid, but helped to make the cigarette pack crush-proof. By using photographs at a time when photography was not mass-produced, they showed the players as they actually were. What they would do is they would hang a baseball on a string and have the player go like this. So you, in some cards you can see the string and the player's glove like this. You know, so they, you know, there couldn't be any movement. And they had really some interesting uh, poses with guys sliding, you know, and they had to hold the position. It's uh, really funny. The old judge set was not numbered, and people are still finding variations The T206 sets 
were distributed during the years 1909 through 1911. The cards are a color lithograph surrounded by a white border. They're one and a half by two and five eighths inches, and the player's name, team, and city appear on the bottom border. The cards were included in 14 different brands of cigarettes with names like Polar Bear, Piedmont, and Sweet Caparo. Of course, this set contains the king of baseball cards, Honus Wagner. Interestingly enough, Honus felt that smoking set a poor example for youngsters and demanded that the company stop producing his card and also recall as many as possible. As a result, there are believed to be only 30 of the Wagner cards in existence today. And listen to this. According to Sports Collector's Digest, the T206 Honus Wagner card is worth over $100,000. How about that? Man, that's probably more money than Honus ever received during his entire career in baseball. Another card that attracts attention from collectors is the Philadelphia Hall of Fame pitcher Eddie Plank. Plank cards are always sought after, but what makes the T206 card so valuable is that the lithograph plate was dropped during the manufacturing of the card, thus making a limited number in release, and therefore quite valuable. Another valuable T206 is Sherry McGee, an infielder with the Philadelphia Phillies. This card's value is not based on his performance, but on the fact that his card was distributed with his name spelled M-A-G-I-E. The misspelling was corrected, thus making the mistake card 400 times more valuable. That makes this the first famous error card, but we'll talk about errors later. These cards are commonly known as the Big Three. Though the set is extremely valuable without these cards, with the Big Three, man alive. Of course, Gowdy, Cracker Jack, ATC, and other companies of the pre-modern day era issued other sets, but it's just impossible to show them all. So many cards, so little time. broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Stay tuned to... The 1940s saw more cards and more card companies, such as Playball, a Philadelphia gum company. Playball issued sets from 1939 to 1941. The 1948 Leaf issues, manufactured by the Leaf Company of Chicago, were black and white photos with the color added. These cards, unlike other baseball cards, were issued late in the season. But what really makes them unique is that most people can't decide whether they find them attractive or not. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you have to be the judge. As they say, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. From 1948 to 1955, Bowman Gum Company of Philadelphia produced sets of baseball cards. By 1949, they became the dominant manufacturer of baseball cards by signing players to exclusive contracts, which made it hard for their competitors to complete sets with the top players. The 1949 set was very similar to the 1948 issue. The biggest difference was that Bowman had their artists hand color black and white photographs, though most collectors didn't seem to care that some of the player poses were identical. Seems like Bowman was turning over a new leaf. In 1950, Bowman gave their cards a new look. Using black and white photos as a reference, they commissioned artists to make paintings of each player. In 1951, Bowman once again borrowed the poses from the previous year. 
The differences between the 1950 and 51 sets were subtle and yet significant. The cards were larger in size and featured the player's name on the face of the card. In 1953, Bowman did something that no other card company ever did before. They used a color photograph on a baseball card. Part of the 53 set was issued in black and white, but this set will always be cited for giving birth to a new format of baseball cards. In 1955, Bowman issued its final baseball card set, a popular issue which has player photographs placed inside a television set. Of course, that was appropriate for the time because fans were tuning in then to watch their favorite teams on the tube. Hmm. I kind of seem to remember something about that. Fun fact. Most people know Danny Ainge and Dave DeBusher from the world of basketball. But did you know they both had baseball cards? <laughs> One of the most commonly asked questions about card collecting is, hey, how do I get started? Well, we told you about the card conventions, and by now, no matter where you live, there's probably a baseball card store near you. I happen to think that uh, the baseball card store is a great place for a kid to come. It's, it's, it's like a little Cooperstown in the store here. We have photographs, we have... Uh, uh, plates, we have bats, we have all different kinds of things and uh, it's, it's a great place for a kid to come to help complete his collection or to find out more things in the hobby. A lot of women are getting into the hobby. Uh, for some reason it's the older women, uh, middle-aged women. For the kids we recommend them to get into all the new cards because if you do hold them long enough they will reach this value right here at the $8,000 to $10,000 level. So uh, basically we try to get the kids into the sets, the new stuff, and advise them to hold on to all of this stuff and just wait its time out so that it will grow. It brings a father and son close together and lets them share some of the common bonds of baseball. A father can sit down and go through the 50s Dodgers or, or New York Giants with his child and tell them about some of his youth and it brings them closer together.
back when I was sitting on a stoop Now, if you collect baseball cards, you probably have heard the name Larry Fritch. With headquarters in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where his son Jeff runs the show. Uh, I made a decision a couple years ago, or maybe long before that, but was finalized a couple years ago, that I got this nice collection and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy looking at it, except it was in a bank because prices have gotten so expensive. And it's not, it wasn't in a bank more, uh, from theft, more, more of my concern is it get destroyed by fire or something, or a tornado or something. And I thought it was kind of crazy that uh, to have this great collection, nobody can enjoy it, including myself. So I decided to do a museum to educate them uh, about the fun of collecting, and that's what we're going to emphasize. We're going to very much de-emphasize value. In fact, the only place that we will have values will be in the card shop itself, where cards are for sale, otherwise we will not emphasize values. Uh, but they're there to be enjoyed, and that's what they're for. It's something we never expect, a hobby. It always will be a hobby for us, but it's, um, it's turned into a business. But it, of all the things I could be doing, I can't think of anything else I'd rather be doing. Well, the days of keeping cards in shoeboxes and wrapped in rubber bands are over. With card collecting comes the responsibility of taking care of them. And gone is the age-old story. My mother threw away all my baseball cards. <laughs> hey, you sure said it, Sharon. But keep in mind some basic rules that still apply. Like keep your cards away from bright lights, heat, and moisture. Today, collectors are afforded many options to take care of their cards. We stopped in at U.S. Gersland a company that manufactures protected plastic products. We've been in business uh, since 1946, and in that time we've sold and produced and sold hundreds of millions of products. Uh, and uh, in the last uh, six or seven years, substantially in the hobby field for uh, housing baseball cards. And uh, the products take the form of uh, clear sheet protectors in which the cards are placed and then we also supply and sell produce albums in which these pages are placed and uh, this allows the collector to keep their cards in a protected and attractive form. We actually tested new and old cards by subjecting them to first of all insertion in the sheets, subjecting them to heat and pressure over a period of months and uh, we've never had a single case, because we use the right plastic, uh, of a migration or a deterioration of the cards. Now, I guess you could say we got our information undercover. Although many collectors have their own ideas about conditions, the following conditions are usually agreed upon.
Fun fact. Everybody knows the story of the T206 Honus Wagner and his feelings about smoking tobacco. But in the 1948 Leaf set, John Peter Wagner, or Honus to his friends, appeared on a card holding and chewing tobacco. In 1952, our boys were still taking shots overseas. But back here, people were still recovering from the shot heard round the world. Bobby Thompson's dramatic pennant-winning home run. The 52 top series, called by many the prototype of the modern-day baseball card, was designed by Topps Vice President Cy Berger with help from the late Woody Gelman. For the first time, a team logo, the player's signature, and their statistics appeared on a baseball card. There were 407 cards in the 52 set. The most sought-after card, number 311, which, of course, is Mickey Mantle every card collector's dream. In the years to follow, Topps would make various changes and add new features and would shape the future of the baseball card. Early years were sometimes referred to as the baseball card wars, 
Topps and Bowman fought it out in the candy stores of America. Topps eventually won by buying out Bowman in 1955. And from 1956 to 1981, Topps enjoyed a virtual monopoly on baseball card production. In 1981, Topps was joined by two new companies. These heavy hitters were Donruss and Flick. Well, I guess there's always room at the top. Fleer, a Philadelphia-based gum company, went into major production in 1981. Although they produced cards for a short stint from the years 1959 to 1963, Fleer's 1981 issue, which has never gained popularity among collectors, was plagued with poor photography, poor statistical information, and inadequate distribution. But Flair went on to make vast improvements in their card design and has grown to become a mainstay for today's card collectors. Don Russ also entered the market in 1981. Don Russ, a Memphis, Tennessee company, experienced similar problems to Fleer's first issue. But in 1984, they hit a home run. The 84 Don Russ set is the most popular of all Don Russ sets and is the most expensive card set of the 1980s. In 1988, score cards took the field by storm, gaining immediate acceptance from collectors. Score is produced by Major League Marketing of Connecticut and distributed by Armorall. Score cards feature high quality photography and exciting graphic design. Score's sister company, the Magic Motion Three Phase Sportflick cards, which debuted in 1986, gave collectors a new kind of baseball card. I guess you could call it a moving experience. Although the major card companies have their own individual style, they all share similar packaging designs. Tops, Donruss, and Fleer all use wax packs. Wax packs contain 15 cards and a premium, heat sealed in a wax wrapper. While Score and Sportflix 
use a package similar to a plastic or foil candy bar wrapper. Tops and Fleer also use a cello pack, which offers the collector a better value for their money. And a package shared by all the companies is the Rack Pack. The Rack Packs give the collector three irregular packs in a plastic strip with the top card in its own window. By looking at the top and bottom card in this see-through package, a collector can determine if the card he wants is located in that rack pack. The card companies usually pack the cards in the same order. So here's a tip. Keep track of what's in the pack. In addition to their regular sets, all the major companies manufacture subsets. The most popular are the update sets. These sets allow the collector to keep on top of the roster moves. One of the first lessons we learn as kids is our ABCs. Krause Publications offer several magazines which cover every aspect of the baseball card hobby, from mail order to collecting tips to up-to-date price guides. When we uh, purchased Sports, Sports Collector's Digest in 1981, uh, we acquired what was what was then as it is now the the premier periodical within the hobby uh, we wanted we brought to it some of the the knowledge or the the experience we'd gained in publishing in other collectible fields since the early fifties and that is uh... the function of a trade paper in any hobby or among any group of hobbyists is to put buyer and seller and traders together. Uh, that's the, the philosophy that drives our publications. We want to make it easy for people to buy and sell by mail. We have a customer service award that we created to let, the, uh, to let a person who's thinking of responding to an ad know a little something more about the, the dealer who carries that award. In essence, that customer service award says that uh, this person operates at a, a higher plane of professionalism than uh, than just the average person you might encounter in the hobby. We feel, as I said, Sports Collectors Digest is being the uh, an advertising medium serves the needs of the most advanced collector. Baseball Cards Magazine and Baseball Card Price Guide Monthly, because they're available on national newsstands, is more aimed at the beginner in addition to the monthly price guides, yearly price guides are published with card prices for card sets issued for the last 100 years. The book lists cards in various conditions. Cards before 1981 will have near mint as their best possible condition. This is due to the scarcity of mint cards during those years. Not only superstar cards are rated, these pages contain prices of common cards the lowest priced cards of all sets. Not just the major producers of sets are listed in this book. There are card sets like regional sets. Regional cards are usually limited to a particular area of the country. Very often they're distributed by local industry. Sometimes these sets are distributed nationally, but almost never in large numbers. Premium sets are usually obtained by sending in proof of purchase coupons or wrappers from products which a consumer may buy. These sets are produced by major manufacturers of consumer goods all across the USA. Now available are limits also known as collector issues. These sets are usually distributed by national chain stores like Woolworth, Rite Aid, and Toys R Us. It seems collectors today have caught the fever. Rookie fever, that is. Rookie cards are the first card of a player issued by a company. These cards will usually be the most valuable card of all the cards produced over a player's career. Cards like the 52 Topps Mantle, the 73 Topps Schmidt, and the 84 Don Russ Mattingly, they all command high prices all over the country. The one thing people enjoy doing with rookie cards is, is speculating. They'll go out and, and uh, buy 100 or 200 or maybe even 500 of a rookie. And what that's done to prices is it's uh, driven rookie card prices up even before the players even tested. You'll find uh, 
Well, for instance, uh, players who've never even played a day in the major leagues, their cards are already 50 cents, 60 cents, 75 cents for each one. But what about the card before the card? Although most collectors don't consider a player's minor league card his rookie card. Minor league cards are produced by companies like Pro Cards, TCMA, Mike Kramer Productions, and Larry Fritch Cards. To learn more about minor league cards, check out Tough Stuff magazine. In the majors, when a player makes too many errors, he stands a good chance of being sent down to the minors. But in card collecting, a minor error usually attracts a major interest from collectors. Errors and variations have occurred ever since the famous McGee era of the T-206's issue. Also in that set were the Ty Cobb variations. Cobb was shown on different backgrounds and in different hitting stances. Al Leiter, the Yankee rookie phenom, had the wrong guy on his card. <laughs> Man, you talk about mistaken identity. And as the story goes, it was Al's mom who noticed the error. So did Topps, and the card was corrected. An error card becomes more valuable when a corrected card is issued, leaving a limited amount of the error card. No matter what thought was crazy or far out has come to pass. History has shown baseball cards to be a great investment. They're still, you know, moving along at, uh, at rates that, that make uh, any other area of collectible Pay a lot in Paris. Like collecting anything, you remember when you got the Mickey Mantle card or the playing card set. You know, finding collectibles is is it probably the, the biggest part of the enjoyment. That's what collecting is about. You know, you acquire something and you keep it. Uh, and it'll be passed on to my son. Amazing. Amazing. That's the word. Well, thanks a lot for looking and listening, folks. I enjoyed being with you. So long, everybody. Joy.